This week on Outdoor Oklahoma, Lake Texoma is arguably one of the nation's top striper destinations. We follow along with our area biologists as they conduct valuable research on this important fishery. Right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Today I'm on Dahlgren Lake at the Lexington Wildlife Management Area just south of Norman. And for a few years, Dahlgren underwent a literal top to bottom renovation. And as of May of 2019, that work is complete and the lake is once again open for the public. A little bit later, we'll visit with one of the biologists that played a key role in this lake's renovation. You know, we say it all the time, but we are so fortunate here in Oklahoma to have so many and various types of angling opportunities. Everything from small department lakes like here at Dahlgren to world-class fisheries like Lake Texoma. Now, Texoma is known for many things, and right at the top of that list has to be its fantastic striper fishing opportunities. So now we're going to follow along with some of our biologists and get an inside look to some of the striped bass management efforts on Texoma. We're on uh, Lake Texoma this evening. Um, we are getting ready to do our juvenile striped bass seining sampling. Uh, this is something that we do annually uh, to track uh, striped bass recruitment at Lake Texoma. Uh, it's very important that we keep track of how well fish have spawned, how well their, uh, their reproduction was each year, so we'll know kind of what the, what the future holds for the fishery. Uh, so this is the early detection that we have for getting that information. Uh, the fish would, would have spawned a couple of months ago, and so this is our first look at what this year's cohort or this year's age class is going to look like for striped bass on Texoma. So tonight we're in the upper portion of Lake Texoma on the Red River Arm. Uh, we have a number of sites that, uh, that we sample each evening. Uh, we, we start in the upper end of the lake because that's where these small fish are located. Uh, they would have migrated down or, or floated downstream uh, as eggs, fertilized eggs, and then hatched in the upper part of the lake. And so what we will do is select these areas, uh, these uh, beach areas, these fish will move in in the evening, and uh, that's how we can collect them with this seining technique. They, they are a, in their native range, they're from the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, and they are an anadromous fish. That means they live their life in coastal and estuarian waters. They go long distances up fresh water to, to spawn. Um, they need to be able to um, release the eggs, have them fertilized, and then drift back to the nursery habitat for several days before they, before they hatch. So there's really specific spawning requirements that a striper needs to have in order to reproduce naturally. Despite being stocked in hundreds of impoundments across the United States, there's only been a, a handful of lakes where natural reproduction has been documented. Uh, two of those lakes are in Oklahoma, being Lake Texoma right here and uh, Lake Keystone. And, uh, um, both of these lakes have long free-flowing river systems that enable these fish to, to go up the rivers um, at the right time of year to be able to spawn. Well, these stripers are going to be anywhere from two to two and a half months old at this time. Um, we're looking at fish that are anywhere from uh, three, or two, two and a half, three, three and a half inches long. Striped bass generally spawn here on Lake Texoma in the month of April and the first half of May. We figure about a 45 day uh, window. And when the calendar's right, when uh, the water temperature's right, and when we get some precipitation that results in uh, water flowing down uh, the rivers and a, and a peak in the hydrographs, uh, these fish will work themselves up river anywhere from 30 to almost 90 miles up river on the Washtenaw and the Red River and, and will uh, we'll, we'll spawn in those locations. Over the next few days after that, the semi-buoyant egg needs to be transported in, in water current back towards the lake where it will um, where it'll hatch and then um, uh, eventually you know as, as it grows throughout the, the first weeks and months of its life will work its way uh, throughout the reservoir. We'll always start 30 minutes after sunset and um, that reduces the amount of variability that we see in our seine halls but also these fish just aren't up in this shallow hot water on these you know sandy beaches like this uh, during the middle of the day. So at night when the water cools off 
uh, there's less predators in the area, these fish will move into shallow water uh, and it allows us to uh, use a seine to, to collect them. Rachel, just stretch it, David, and keep it low. Keep it low, low, low. Just drag it across. There you go. There you go. Got some fish in there. All right, nice and slow. Keep going. Okay. You look at the fish from the side, you don't really see it, but how we identify the striped bass, if you look along the top of it, it has these vertical bars, kind of looks like tiger striping, they call those par marks. Uh, and that's one of the characteristics that we use to identify the striped bass versus the native white bass that we also have in Texoma. Here's an example of a white bass, and if you rotate that fish, you won't really see uh, those par marks, those vertical bars. But uh, at this stage, uh, these two cousins are pretty, uh, pretty similar in, uh, in size and shape and color, so that's one of the characteristics that we look for. We're seeing a, a variation in sizes. Here's a pretty good sized striped bass for this time of year, all the way down to, to here's one that's uh, considerably smaller. Two things could happen. One, since we have a fairly lengthy spawning period, uh, one could just be older than the other. Uh, several weeks, maybe a month older than the other. Also, uh, we start seeing uh, differences in diet selection. The smaller size stripers are, are generally eating zooplankton and insects, whereas the, the larger ones that will continue to outgrow the smaller uh, members of the same cohort have learned to um, capture and select um, other fish. They've turned to piscivory. They're eating a lot of uh, silver sides and uh, young of the year uh, shad. So a much uh, more advantageous diet that they're consuming, which is, uh, which is giving them uh, accelerated growth. So these are all small young of the year stripers that were collected in our first seine haul. Uh, it looks, uh, looks really optimistic at this point and uh, illustrates that uh, not only did the stripers get off a, a successful spawn, but uh, but looks like uh, we've got a, a, a great year class that our anglers are going to enjoy in the years to come. So while we're doing this, we're just trying to keep this seine moving as fast as possible, but keeping it low right down on the bottom so the fish can't escape underneath the seine. Pull that bottom part, Rachel, grab the bottom, pull it up, there you go. All right, everybody's in. Here's another large white bass right here. So we've got a mixture of some, some young predators like the stripers and white bass. We've got uh, different uh, shad species. Um, here are, here's a juvenile silver side. Uh, it's an important food item for these young stripers and age one stripers that are out there. Yep. Yep. Right now what we're doing is we're uh, sorting out uh, the two maronid species, which are the temperate bass, that includes the white bass and the striped bass. Uh, we're separating those out, identifying those fish and separating them into two different buckets. Uh, after we're com we've completed that task, then we'll go back and count how many of each species uh, were collected at this spot. So this left-hand bucket is our striped bass, uh, juvenile striped bass. and uh, good numbers there. The bucket on the right are the white bass. Obviously from these numbers you can see that there were a lot more uh, striped bass uh, spawned this year, at least at this site where we've sampled, uh, but the 
the spawn was obviously really good for striped bass because those numbers are really strong. So what we're doing here is we're keeping a, a subsample of these striped bass. Uh, we're able to take a small bone out of the, the head of these fish called an otolith and we can prepare them in such a way that we can count daily rings. Um, from this we're able to tell uh, what day um, uh, they, were, they were spawned on and um, we're able to match that up with, uh, hopefully be able to match that up with the hydrograph or what was going on, the, on the, in the river at that point and to see, um, see uh, if they spawned early in the season or later in the season or uh, what, what kind of flow that uh, was uh, uh, beneficial to them. So one of the unique things about Lake Texhoma is the natural reproduction of the striped bass. Most uh, North American reservoirs with striped bass have to stock those populations. Lake Texhoma is one of very few lakes that actually have naturally reproducing fish. The interesting thing on Texhoma is we have two, uh, two river systems that allow for that reproduction, uh, the Washita River and the Red River. Now we're on the Red River tonight doing our sampling. Uh, but in the past, we've, uh, research has shown that these fish will swim anywhere from 45 to 80 miles upriver, uh, up the red, because it's unimpounded. They have the ability to swim and migrate uh, long distances up uh, into the red. They lay their eggs. Uh, the males and females will congregate. The eggs are fertilized uh, in rapid flowing water. Uh, they're fertilized there, and those semi-buoyant eggs are transported back down into Lake Texoma. Uh, if there wasn't enough flow, those, those eggs would eventually settle to the bottom and those, egg, those fertilized eggs would suffocate and would never actually hatch. So we need the springtime flows to, bring, to transport those eggs downriver all the way back uh, to uh, right at the mouth of the river where it meets the lake and that's where those fish will hatch and that's where those juveniles will have the opportunities to forage uh, and begin their early life uh, early portions of their life. Different species of fish have different reproductive strategies. The striped bass swims up river, will release a massive amount of eggs, but there's zero parental care. It's just left up to the river currents to, to take the egg to the favorable nursery habitat. Other species of uh, fish, like a threadfin shad, will put their adhesive egg on, on rocks or vegetation or on docks and, and a uh, little, little bit different. They're, they, they put their egg in a place and it's not as, as, as vulnerable as, as eggs flowing down the river. But then there's other species of fish like crappie or bass, uh, bluegill, that'll actually uh, make a nest and um, they will sit there and guard those eggs and even the small fry until, until they're less vulnerable to predation. So they put a lot more uh, parental care into, into their uh, egg investment. But the, again, the striped bass, they, they, they release their egg um, in, the, in, in the current and uh, just a massive amount of them, um, knowing that uh, you know, a fair amount of them will, uh, will, will make it back to the, uh, to the nursery habitat that, that is needed. So these are all striped bass of the same year class. Obviously a lot different in, uh, in size. Got this uh, giant right here all the way down to uh, intermediate sized and a small one. Likely these were maybe spawned at the beginning of the season, perhaps spawned at the end of the season. And uh, this one just by body size and large mouth, he's gonna be able to consume a, a, a fish diet a lot easier than what a small one like this will that'll probably be limited to zooplankton and insects most of its uh, first year of life. Lake Texoma is arguably one of the state's most economically and recreationally important fisheries. So uh, with, with striped bass being king on Lake Texoma. So uh, this is one thing that we can do to um, ensure we have a good idea of what's going on with the striped bass population, uh, get an early look at what this year class is gonna be like uh, for the future, um, enables us to 
um, have some good talking points with, with people that, of, of what to expect in the years to come, as well as uh, just a general management of our, of our fisheries as we're not gonna be able to effectively sample these with gill nets for, for a couple of years. You know, this isn't the striped bass that our anglers are looking for, but it's a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, it lets us know how strong a given year class of fish are, uh, how good the spawn was that year, and we can track these changes uh, in the numbers of these fish that we collect during this type of sampling. Uh, so during uh, drought years, we see fewer of these, uh, but also during uh, good flow years, high water springs, uh, we see a lot of these fish. And what that does, it allows us to communicate with our constituents, let them know what the future looks like. Um, this is a fish that will be in our recreational fishery a uh, year and a half, two years from now. And so we can uh, educate our anglers about what's coming on in the future years and kind of give them ideas about the trends that we see in the fishery and predict uh, what the fishing success might be uh, in coming years. Well, Kurt, we're back here on Dahlgren and some of my earliest memories of ever coming out here were well over 20 years ago and buddies and I would go over to the dam and duck hunt out here because that's really all that you could do out here. You're right, Todd, you, you nailed it. Um, duck hunting was a big draw here simply because the fishery was very limited access wise. It was a decent fishery. It had a lot of bass and sunfish here, but the anglers couldn't necessarily get at that because we had limited access. There was a lot of weeds and vegetation problems choking the shoreline and, and very limited access unless you had a boat. So what we're trying to do now is change that and provide that access to our anglers. You know, this is actually just one of several different project lakes that we've been working on over the last few years, right? Correct. We've, we've had a concerted effort in Fisheries Division to try and renovate these lakes and make them the jewels of Oklahoma fishing. Our ODWC lakes, we feel, should be our better fisheries. Dahlgren Lake here does have a history of producing a, a good sunfish and quality sunfish, so we're focusing the effort here, management-wise, on producing quality sunfish, trophy sunfish, and, and providing that, that fishery for novice anglers, for, for children, for kids to come out and access this easily from the bank and catch those sunfish. Now, over the years during this, this uh, renovation project, I've had the pleasure of coming out and seeing it at all different stages. And it's, it's been fascinating to see how much effort and planning is going into this. So tell us some about it. Sure, this has been a, about almost a three-year project um, and a three-year process to get us to this point. Uh, we put a lot of effort into providing fish habitat and producing a quality fishery, but our real focus here was simply on the access. We needed to allow anglers to access this fishery. Um, we improved the boat ramp. We provided a new expanded parking area. We've got a brand new floating dock to, to allow our anglers to get on the lake. We built five fishing jetties that are accessible from shore so that bank anglers can get out here and catch those fish. So, Although the fishery was part of the focus of our renovation, uh, I would say the primary focus was simply on providing quality access and allowing our anglers the opportunity to access these fish from shore. You know, one of my favorite aspects of this project has been these unique types of fish habitats that you've put out here, and I'd never seen it done before. Right. We, being the fishery research lab in Norman, we have some creative folks there and we did come up with some unique ideas. One of them being um, using these trees that we cut and sinking them into the ground upside down so the root wad stays near the top of the water. Um, it provides overhead cover for bass and sunfish and it also provides a target for these anglers from the bank where they can see that habitat out there and cast towards it knowing that there's likely to be fish around there. Well it's so neat to think that you know we can see a few of these right behind us here and that's literally the upside down root wad of a tree and the trunk is down in the ground. That's correct. That's pretty ingenious. <laughs> Even though this is uh, this was nearly a three-year project the fish aren't necessarily just three years old. That's right Todd. So what we did here in order to have the fishery ready for anglers is we have stocked it with adult fish. So the adult sunfish that are, are in this lake have been here for several years and they're four to five and six years old and they're producing multiple year classes of fish. Um, we have adult bass in the lake, we have adult catfish in the lake because we wanted to have it ready for our anglers when we did open it. We didn't want them to be having to catch small fish and, and juvenile fish, young fish. We stocked it with adult fish simply so we'd have it ready for our anglers. 
Well, I know anglers are going to uh, be excited to know that this is finally open and ready for business out here with plenty of new and improved access. Yes, sir. So the adult bass kind of have a unique little story. That's right. The, the adult bass in this lake have come from a couple of different sources, one of them being our Durant State Fish Hatchery. What we have done is periodically re retire some of our brood stock from our Florida Largemouth Bass Program. And we were fortunate enough that we got about 50 of those retired brooders to live out retirement here in Dahlgren Lake. So they're gonna be providing uh, a genetic boost to the bass population in this lake for years to come while enjoying their retirement. <laughs> That's great. You know, uh, there are lots of great things going on in our fisheries division, and this really is the heyday of fishing here in Oklahoma. So we'd hope that you would take an opportunity to get out and enjoy one of our great opportunities statewide this summer. Hey, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Fishing. Hunting, wildlife management, resource protection, habitat conservation, public outreach, and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. Making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job, it's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long. The employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving. And our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909 without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. But hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognized that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction to unimaginable numbers As much as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. And you can hear it on the landscape.
You'll find us working hard to make your state's natural resources the most healthy in the land. We are. We are. We are. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Uh -huh.